I was coming to Bensal a few weeks ago and I was behind a small cattle truck in the main street, just driving along slowly. In the back of this truck was this big Angus bull. And on the back of the truck was a sign that says, Bulls for Hire. Does your cow need some loving? <laughs> Only in the country, right? Only in the country. Um, like, and, and, and if, if life was only that simple, <laughs> um, this week was Coral's and my wedding anniversary. 46 years being married. And to celebrate that, I went up the mountains with my brother Jeff deer hunting. And... That's right, you were there too, Kath. You were, right? Um, I did see you later in the day, yes. Yeah. But, but on, on our wedding anniversary, I got contacted by Facebook. And, and Facebook, instead of wishing us a happy wedding anniversary and a little photo from somewhere in the past, they sent me a notice to say that one of my posts from four years ago had been taken down because I had violated their community standards. Their technology had discovered this terrible thing that I had done. Because I'd put up a photo, of, a video of some pups and I just had this caption, stag and pups enjoying life. And because this goes against their, their rules, it says that their technology has discovered my offence and their technology has prosecuted me. And in fact, in explaining their very high moral ground against these ugly people that would ever breed an animal, we love animals, we just hate the people that breed them. And so, so what they, they say, this is what it says, our standards are global and they apply everywhere. Even if something isn't restricted in your region or your country, your nation, where you live, it may go against our rules. People in another country who you don't vote into power have control globally. And the reason behind it is they are wanting to produce a utopia, a better world. And so they're using rules to control us, which means that my freedom to even put up a post of some stagger pups that are not for sale is deemed against their standards. You cannot create a perfect world with law. And what they're searching for is a kingdom from another place. Every human heart is searching for a better world, a better life. It, we, we're searching for what Jesus came to bring to earth, which is a kingdom. It's a government from another place. And I need your expert opinion this morning. I would like... For you to tell me, do you think life is more complicated today than 200 years ago? Okay. Some of you, even if you think that, you hate putting up your hand so much, you will not put up your hand for anything. I understand that. Some of you will just put up your hand just to be involved, doesn't matter, you know. But, but life, life is more complicated. And as life gets complicated, it also gets more stressful. And there are some days, for some of you, it can be overwhelming all the competing demands upon your time. And, and we say that upon our time, but it's not really true. It's upon our energy. See, life is far more about energy management than time management. You, you can have all the time in the world to do something. If you don't have the energy for it, you'll put it off. 
you'll find excuses. You, you, won't, you won't do it. Like cleaning your bedroom for kids, right? Who wants to clean a bedroom or do dishes and stuff like that? But the greatest challenge in life is actually processing all the conflicting, complicated, complex demands upon us. And it does involve our time. If you want to go shopping at Kmart and at Woolies, they're a long way apart. If you've got to pick up kids from somewhere, take them somewhere, it takes time. If you want to see a doctor at the hospital, Joy, how many hours were you in casualty for? Six hours just to see a doctor. It takes time. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just go to work, clock on and go home again? But we, we, it, takes, it takes time to work, to get an income. 2,000 years ago, people lived at walking pace. And to people that didn't have to worry about a mortgage, to, to people that, that could build a house any way they liked, out of any materials they liked, to these people, Jesus says... Do not worry. Some translations actually, this is in Matthew chapter 6, he, he says, do not, be, do not be anxious. Well, thank you very much, Jesus. That's helpful, isn't it? Do not worry. Like, as if, as if being anxious was a choice. If you walked into our kitchen some mornings, or most mornings, on our bench will be a list of things that I'm to do for the day. <laughs> I appreciate your organisational skills, Coral. Never once on that list, as Coral said, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Never once. It, it's, it's not a box you can just tick. It's not just something you can do. It's, it's not part of a list of chores for the day. There's a one-hit wonder that was written in 1988. And it, it's a song that went all around the world, written by a guy called Bobby McFerrin. And it was called Don't Worry, Be Happy. I think we're going to... That's it. <laughs> Some of you, it's bringing back memories, isn't it? That little reggae, don't worry, be happy. Right. That's about as long as we can do before YouTube bumps us off or something terrible. Yeah. But so I didn't even do the words. We're thinking... The, they won't pick up the algorithm of the, of the whistling as much as the words, you know. <sighs> those people out there. But somehow those words, they resonated with the human heart because we long to live free from anxiety and worry. But that song was useless. It didn't help. In that song, all that he did was sing about all the terrible things that happen in life and don't worry, be happy. I can't do accents, can I? Mandy tells me if you can't sing, you can't do accents. And I can't sing. That explains it, doesn't it, right? But God, God created life to be simple, not complicated. He never designed us to experience anxiety and stress. That stuff will kill you. And unlike dear old Bobby's song about don't worry, be happy, that had no answers, Jesus actually has answers. When he's talking in Matthew 6, he's talking to, to help us get free, to be set free, to live a life that we want to be free from anxiety and worry. Coral's grandmother was a beautiful Christian woman, but she was riddled with anxiety her whole life. And you can be a Christian, you can love God, you can speak in tongues, and you still can struggle with anxiety. 
You can be worried about many things. And the way out has nothing to do with your personality or even the circumstances that you're in. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. You may not worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow, what you're going to wear, but that little tiny list begins with don't be anxious about your life. <laughs> and life, life's a big word Jesus used. It's, it's your inner self. It's your inner being. It's, it's who you really are. And when we are living with ownership and not access to the kingdom, there'll be something in our life that we're anxious about, even if we have food and clothing. And when Matthew writes this, there are no chapters in what he wrote. It wasn't till some turkeys back in 18, 13, yeah, 1382, that's what it was, a long time ago, they got together and they thought, let's stick some chapters in the Bible and we're going to stick some verses in there. And then more recently, some even bigger turkeys, they decided that they would put headings in the chapters based on subject matter or something that was a concept that they could see in the chapter. And so these very smart people, just before you get to verse 25 in Matthew 6, in your Bibles it will say, do not worry. But that's not where Jesus begins teaching on how to be free from anxiety and worry. In fact, the whole of that chapter really is what he's building up to. It begins way, way before then. And don't worry, be happy. That's all you'll hear if you begin in chapter 25, at verse 25, where Jesus says, don't worry. It's, it's what goes beforehand that sets it all up to understand what's coming next. We don't need more Christians that feel like they've got to do more and try harder. We, we don't more, need more Christians that are feeling like, I've got to do this, I've got to stop doing that. And Jesus is actually showing us dramatically a very simple way to live. It's a life free from stress and worry. Now, he doesn't give us 10 steps of how to. It's not theory. He's speaking from first-hand experience. This is Jesus talking. When I was in Sunday school, a little kid, good morning, Carly. Just relax, just relax, just, just chill. When I, when I was a little kid in Sunday school, we sang a song. I don't know if I'm going to try this or not. I'll try it. Okay. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. Have I proved it? Done it? Yeah. See, I can't sing. But I remember the song and this thought that Jesus was carrying all of God's grand plan for us. He, has, he had all that in his hand and he says, don't worry. That, that's a lot to carry. Did Jesus ever feel anxious or worried? That's a lot to carry. See, God cannot fail and he can't be tempted. But Jesus could have failed. It's why Satan tempted him. Because it was possible. He didn't but it was possible. Because everything Jesus did, he did as a man in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we struggle with understanding that. That's a hard concept to get your head around. So what is his solution for us? 
Well, in chapter 6 of Matthew, Jesus is comparing kingdoms, opposing kingdoms. And he says, you can know which one you're operating in by just one simple thing. It's an emotion, anxiety. If you're feeling anxious, you're functioning in a kingdom that is of this world. But there's another kingdom. It's not of this world, but it's where anxiety and fear and worry do not exist. And you can be free. Our world is a kingdom of ownership, and I talked about this last week. God's kingdom is a kingdom of access to all the resources of heaven, and it's freedom. And Jesus makes it so simple for us, and his way of doing it is just this. This is as simple as it is. It's just a priority. It's just one priority. That's it. It's so stressful trying to deal with all the priorities of life, trying to juggle all the things that you've got to try to juggle. And Jesus says, just, just get one right. It's about a kingdom. It's forgetting about all the other demands. It's actually a kingdom that is like a coin with two sides. And the two sides of this kingdom is... Seek first his kingdom and right relationship with the king. And all the other things will be added to. All the other things that we would seek will seek us. But how? How how do you seek God's kingdom? It's, it's, It's okay to know, okay, seek God's kingdom. But how? How do we do that? In a general sense... I live my life free from anxiety and worry and fear. I really do. But that has not always been my experience. And before that little heading in our Bibles that says, do not worry, before that, that, the verse right before that, verse 24, Jesus says this, no one can serve two masters, either you will hate one or love the other, You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some translations use the word wealth or riches. But surprisingly, there's a whole chunk of translations that use the Aramaic word that Jesus used, mammon. What in the world is mammon? And why would you put that in an English Bible? Because Jesus wasn't referring to money. Mammon is something different. So they just put that word in. But what it, what's it mean? Well, it's all the things that we seek after, that we get attached to, that we put our hope, that we put our trust in, that we, we put all our energy towards. It covers all those things. For me, in my life, that's been a struggle. I've struggled finding how do I balance the different directions I want my life to go. That I want to I want to seek his kingdom, but I, I, I want to do my own things. I want to do my own stuff. And so I've shared this story before, but for some of you, you don't know this story. But in my early 30s, I was part of a church here in Bansdale and we had a really strong youth group. And I got so busy wanting to build my own empire, I walked away from what I knew God had called me to do. And those kids just disbanded and were lost. And it wasn't for a number of years later that after I had lost my own little empire I was trying to build, God re-called me back to youth ministry. And I can remember that the, the sense of grief I felt with turning my back on what God had for me and the consequences to the kids that we'd lost. And then in early 1992, God 
recycle this failed human being that had walked away from all God had for us. And Bev, you were there, part of that. You, you saw what happened to the, to the youth in those days and, and we went through different leaders and stuff and then, and then we started Solid Rock Youth Group and Charlie, you are part of that, right? And God's grace gave me another opportunity. But even with that, I was struggling with my own things like deer hunting. And, and there was a weekend where Jeff and I went up the mountains and Jeff had a fairly good Subaru four-wheel drive and, and um, we went up on a Saturday and we'd been hunting all day and just late in the day I'd, I'd shot a deer that had, that had got away and we just wanted to make sure it wasn't unwell. So we're, we're trying to track this thing and we had a few little spots of blood and, and we tracked it and tracked it and tracked it and then it got dark and, we, and we're using torchlight. And by about midnight, we're still trying to track this thing and we're sort of giving up. So we drove back to where we lived. I got some scent trailing hounds and we took these hounds, these fox hounds, put them on leads and tried to lead them to... By now it's raining. It's about two in the morning, it's raining, the scent's been washed away, so we give up, we, we put the dogs back in the Subaru and we went back and we kept trying to find this deer till the sun came up, all night. Eventually, because it was church that morning, we had to get back for church and band practice. And when we got back to the Subaru, my beautiful dogs had eaten the whole of the back of Jeff's seat of his vehicle, because we'd locked him in the vehicle, right? They chewed it to bits, destroyed his lovely Subaru. Jeff was not happy with me. It's not the first time. And so we're driving out of the bush, and Jeff's tired, and, and we're in a rush to get back to band practice for church, and Jeff failed to negotiate a bend hit a big rock, went airborne in the Subaru, we went smack into this big tree. I was so winded, I'm going, oh, Jeff's looking at me, are you okay? I'm, oh, I couldn't talk, I had just no air in me. And all the dust is settling and the dogs have come over from the back to the front and now the car is really destroyed, completely wrecked, written off. And so now we're walking. 16 k's of bush tracks walking and as we're walking along with our dogs feeling very miserable with ourselves I felt the Holy Spirit whisper to me would I search for a wounded young person like I did for that deer and in that moment God got my heart right and I never have since that day found it hard to balance things that I like compared to putting God's kingdom first. And now dear seek me. Nearly. How do you enter God's kingdom? How do we move from owning our stuff to accessing all he has for us? Jesus explains it many ways in parables and stories and teaching, but I think the most easiest to get your head around how you enter the kingdom is found in two verses. One is in Matthew chapter 18 and one is in Luke chapter 18. And I just want to read to you Luke chapter 18 verse 17 first. And this is Jesus talking and he starts off by saying, I tell you the truth. And whenever you hear Jesus say, I tell you the truth, he says, you're not going to believe me. I can feel a pushback already. So, so in advance, I'm telling you, this is true. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And then Matthew 18, verse 3 says, same thing. He says, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And when we hear that, the mistake we make is thinking about what a little child is like compared to an adult. See, a, a little child trusts. They're innocent. They believe what you say. But that's a mistake to see those verses through that lens. The secret to understanding those verses, what Jesus is saying, is found in what children don't have. Children do not have life. Oh, that was clever. Children do not have life experience. Adults have life experience. And experience can be a really terrible teacher. It's a terrible way to try to enter God's kingdom with experiences of life. It'll hold us back. Some of those experiences can be through your family of origin. It may not have set you up well in life. Some of them can be experiences because you've been part of a church and, and you've accumulated a lot of beliefs that our Western church carries that are not always helpful. And if you're new to Jesus, you can be carrying the values and the culture of our world that doesn't function anything like the kingdom of God. So experience can be a really bad teacher. It's why every time Jesus began speaking about the kingdom, he used this word, metaneo. It's a metaneo, metaneo, metaneo. And the reason I'm using that Greek word and sounding really stupid <laughs> is because if I use the English word, I've got to then help you unlearn it. Because, see, the English word he, he would say was repent and believe the good news. And when you hear repent, you already think it's about being sad and sorry for all the bad things you've done. And it's not... It simply means be willing to unlearn what you already think you know. That would hold you back. Be willing to see life differently. Be willing to take on something that is different to your experience as taught you. Disappointment teaches us to not trust people to not trust churches, not trust God or ourself. And success, that, that can be a handicap to carry through life because you can, you can live the rest of your life trying to get back the success you once had and feeling like you can still do it all in your own strength. It's a handicap. Experience is not a good teacher when it comes to the kingdom of God. I'll finish with this verse. It's in Ephesians 3.20. And this is Paul speaking. And he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all our experiences would teach us. Immeasurably more than all we could ask. See, we won't ask based on experiences. Immeasurably more than you can imagine. Our, our imagination is so shut down. Because of experiences. And then he talks about God's power working and you think, fantastic, at last. We can just rely on God's power. That'll work. But that's not what Paul says. He says, according to his power that is working within us. See, that's the kingdom. The kingdom is internal in us. For there to be a kingdom, there has to be a territory. There has to be a king reigning over a territory. And that territory is within us. And when that kingdom of God is operating in us, and we've entered into it, not based on experience, but based on trusting in everything Jesus says, there's a power. It's God's power. It's the Holy Spirit within us. 
And then he says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. I, I find it fascinating that Paul puts the church ahead of Jesus where the glory will be seen on earth. I meet a lot of people that say they're not very fond of church, but they're okay with Jesus. But it doesn't work that way. We're his bride. And he says, through all the generations, which includes us, forever and ever, amen. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you want to do immeasurably more in us than we could ever ask or imagine. Our limited experiences hold us back so much. And we want to enter your kingdom. Help us to unlearn, to, to have a different response to our experiences have told us and taught us in the past. And to take the simplicity of your priorities and seek entering your kingdom first. And allow a right relationship with the king to influence every part of our life. And then things that we would put all our energy into seek us. That simple priority alignment, that's all it has to be. You sort out the rest. I thank you for that. I thank you, Jesus. For those online, if you've stayed with us to that last little bit, I'm just in awe of how many of you are connected to Red Gum. And I appreciate you. We, we, we value you. And thank you for being part of what God's doing amongst us.